Konnichiwa. I am Mike Bursell, um, and I've used about half of my Japanese words already. So uh, I will uh, conduct this in English. I hope that's OK. Um, if you have questions um, about how, what I'm saying, please do s put your hand up. I will try and keep time for questions at the end. But if there's something you don't understand as we go through, please do let me know, and I will try to help. Um, I have 88 slides, so I'm going to be going fairly quickly. But don't, don't worry, we'll be fine. So this is me. Um, these slides are available uh, already on the uh, sched or shed.com. So if you do need to look at them later on, please do. And I'm always very happy to be contacted if you have any questions. So this is what I want to talk about uh, today. Firstly, what is the problem we're trying to, uh, to deal with? Uh, what is confidential computing? The joy of attestation. Uh, and then three different use cases, well, four, actually. And then a very little bit about the confidential computing consortium. So what is the problem we're trying to solve? Well, the problem is arguably uh, brought on by abstraction. So who knows what that is? It's a synchronous gearbox. That's another view of it. Uh, and luckily, most of the time when we drive a car, we don't care about it because it is abstracted by that. That is what we see. Uh, in fact, sometimes it's abstracted by that. So we need to care even less. But it causes problems for us sometimes. So virtualization provides abstraction. It allows you to run uh, workloads as if they were on a single machine, a virtual machine. Um, uh, so you don't need to worry about resource sharing, et cetera. And abstraction, when it's done correctly, should also provide isolation of layers. However, that is not always the case. There are three types of isolation. One is workload from workload. Two is uh, isolating the host from the workload, so the workload can't do bad things. And the third is protecting and isolating the host, the uh, workload from the host in the case where you have a compromised or malicious host. And the problem we have is that standard virtualization does not help us here. Standard virtualization does not uh, provide workload from host isolation. So confidential computing is the protection of data in use which is the isolation, by performing computation in a hardware-based, attested uh, execution environment. And uh, it's very important for many workloads because uh, you have sensitive data, you have sensitive applications. And hardware-based TEs allow you to uh, provide this isolation without having to trust the operating system or any other parts of the host. We have a problem, though. So if I say to you, uh, let's say you own the operating system, and I say to you, have you isolated this? You'll say, yes, yes, yes. But I can't trust you, so how do I know that's the case? So attestation allows you to have that assurance. And there are a variety of ways of doing attestation. This is one way of doing remote attestation. So in this example, we have a, a large uh, gray box. That is our host. And we have a, a CPU and or a GPU. Uh, and we have a trusted execution environment, which is basically a set of memory pages um, which have been uh, isolated by the CPU. And inside that, we have an application and some data. So what we do then is the application says to the CPU or GPU, please provide a measurement, a hash of, uh, of what's in there. And the CPU does that, and it cryptographically signs that with a key which is kept inside the GPU and cannot be extracted. You then send that to an attestation service, which should be owned by somebody different. And assuming they say, OK, we have some assurances. We can be assured that the T is on valid hardware, that it is correctly set up, 
and that the software in there is what we expect. These are very important primitives because it allows me to do a number of things. So this thing down here, this measurement, is a signed thing. It is basically a certificate. And with a certificate, we can do many, many interesting things. We could use it for transport encryption, for instance. We could use it to prove identity of what is inside that TE. We can prove uniqueness of what is inside that TE as well. And we can extend it for signing. We can uh, sign the uh, output of the application. And that is as well as providing us with the confidentiality and integrity assurances that we get from using ATEE. So what I want to do is try combining these properties and see what this gives us. Because this is useful to start with, but let's actually use it. Any questions about this? Is this all clear? Excellent. So our first UK use case is artificial intelligence. Has anybody heard of AI recently? Probably, yes. Every, and you can't move for it. So we are going to be looking at training and inferences. Uh, and we are looking at confidentiality and integrity through all these steps, provenance tracking, and communications uh, confidentiality. So, um, what does this allow us to do? So, let us just assume that we have uh, a training model with two data sets. So, the first thing we're going to do is put it into a TEE. And we're then going to uh, create an attestation measurement of that entire uh, TEE. So, we now know we've got the, uh, the data sets and the training model. Now, immediately, we can... Uh, have assurances that we have protected the confidentiality and integrity of both those data sets, but also of the training model. So already we have useful properties. But once we have the output of that, which is of course an inference engine, we can take that attestation with us, which means that we can track the provenance of that uh, of that inference engine back to the training model and those data sets. When we query it, we can say, I know that that, an that that answer is coming from that data set and that model. So um, we can also protect the inference engine's confidentiality and integrity so that people can't uh, mess with that. And also, when we talk to it, we can know that the questions I ask it and the answers I get are also protected. So we have managed, just with these capabilities, to provide five very, very useful assurances when we're doing AI. Firstly, that the Data sets are protected, their confidentiality and integrity. Second, that the same is true of the training model, confidentiality and integrity. We can track, and this is some ways the most important thing, the provenance of that inference engine back to that data. We can be sure that what answers we get are coming from that data. And uh, number fourth, Number four, we can protect the confidentiality and integrity of that inference engine. And fifth, we can protect the queries and the responses. I recently spoke to a very large bank in the UK, an American bank, global bank in the UK, uh, and they said that they could not currently put their risk models into AI because they cannot afford to run it internally but they can't put it out on the uh, cloud because they can't be sure of the training model and the data are safe or that the inference engine is correct and they also need this confidentiality and the provenance. So this allows them to answer all of these questions. So this is my first use case. We have all of these things. This is the simplest use case. It gets more complicated. 
So the next one is multi-party collaboration. So my first example is financial collaboration. So let's say we have three different banks, okay? And they don't trust each other, not completely. Uh, but they have common requirements and they need to do some shared computation. Maybe at the end of the day, they need to reconcile all their accounts. Uh, maybe they want to be checking uh, for fraud. Maybe there is a customer they want to check their credit rating. They need to share data, but they can't share it with each other. They need to compute on it. So, this is our starting point. We have uh, three banks, each has their own data set, and they have a collaborative application that all of them have seen. They all agree that this is going to be okay and it's going to do what it should do. Maybe it's open source, we hope so. So the first thing we do is we put that into a trusted execution environment. And we create an attestation measurement. And that allows each of the three banks to be sure that the application is the one they originally checked. It also allows them to be sure that it is being protected. They've got both the confidentiality and the integrity of that uh, application are being protected. Which means, excellent, I am now happy to put my data into this uh, TE so it can run, uh, it, the collaborative data uh, application can run. Because the confidentiality and integrity of my data sets are also protected. And of course, when the output comes, we can uh, use the attestation measurement that we created before as part of the output or create a different measurement and again be sure that it did come out of that collaborative application that we first checked. So I can now check the provenance of that output and trust that output as well. So we have managed to get four very useful uh, assurances out of this model. We've proved the correctness of the application. We've protected the confidentiality and integrity of that application. We've protected the uh, confidentiality and integrity of the data sets. And we can now trust the output as well. This makes sense. Good. Excellent. I will go to my next one. So, this is uh, pharmaceutical research. So, let us assume that uh, I have a pharmaceutical research company. And in order to do my research, I need data, uh, patient data, from two different hospitals. Hospitals do not want to give pharmaceutical research companies all of their uh, data from their, their patients. And in fact, under most uh, laws, I'm sure it's true in Japan, you can't just give patient data uh, to be used as you wish. So full disclosure is not acceptable, but we still need the data to compute on it. And we'd prefer that data not to be lossy. So yes, we could use things like differential privacy, but being able to have the full data set would be preferable. So, let us go through this. We have uh, on the left two hospitals, and we have a pharmaceutical research company. I've called them H and P, just because I don't have space. So, in this case, the pharmaceutical uh, research company has an application. It has created that application, and it is going to share that application with the hospitals or possibly to a third party who will do a, an audit of that. And that audit will say, this application will not output your data. It will only do these operations on maybe a small data set such as age, uh, sex, whether they're a smoker or not, and what their weight is. And 
then give maybe a percentage score that they are likely to get a particular cancer or diabetes or something. So what we are proving is that the da any data from the hospitals will not be misused by that application. Right. So having done that, I take a cryptographic hash of that application. And I share that hash with the hospitals. And then I run it in a TEE. And the first thing I do is create an attestation measurement of that TEE. And that attestation measurement allows the hospitals to know that the application running in there is the application that was shared with me before, because they have the same cryptographic hash. They are byte for byte, bit for bit, exactly the same application. Also, we, I know as a pharmaceutical company that my application's confidentiality and integrity is being protected, which I also care about. This model is important to me. The hospitals are now happy to share their data because they know that the application in use there is going to do what it should do because we've checked. And when I get the output as a pharmaceutical company, I can be sure that it has come from the data sets that went in and using the application that I uh, started. So this time we have five useful assurances that we have been able to create from this. First, we've proved that the application was the one that we wanted, and that matters both to the hospitals and to the pharmaceutical company. We've protected the confidentiality and integrity of that application, which cares to the pharmaceutical company. We've protected the confidentiality of the data sets, which matters to the hospitals. Uh, and so that's for three and four. And we can trust, uh, so the integrity matters to the, to the pharmaceutical company and the confidentiality to the hospitals. Uh, and five, we now we trust the correctness of the output, which matters to the pharmaceutical company. This all make sense? Attestation measurements are very cool and very, very useful indeed. So whilst confidentiality and integrity on their own are important, with these extra assurances, we get a lot more business value out of them. Right, I'm now going to move to my uh, last and most complicated uh, use case, so I'm going to have a drink of water. If I had a headband, I would put it on now. I believe that's the correct thing to do, but I, I'm, I believe that I can do this, so wish me luck. So this one is for Web3, and it's about offers on the blockchain. And we have three, uh, four different parties here. We have uh, a DAP provider, an application provider. Uh, we've got an independent resource uh, provider, and they're going to provide a uh, computation resource. Um, think of them like a cloud, but an individual person, for instance, or a, 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 an organization. We have a consumer, someone who actually wants to do something with uh, an application, uh, and we have what I'm calling here an independent process manager, and I'll explain what they do in a minute. None of these parties know or trust each other. Really important. And uh, this is a quote from, a, uh, from the, the person who coined the phrase uh, web version three, web three, Gavin Wood. We want less trust, but more truth. So we're going to try that. I'll walk you through it, and you can tell me at the end if I have succeeded. I'm going to build it up slowly. First of all, we have a blockchain. This is a block. You can, it's, it's a chain. It's got blocks in it, so it must be a blockchain. Good start. 
The next thing we have is a whole bunch of different people who are, are providing smart contracts. And I've called them here independent process managers because they allow you to manage a process. And each one is different, um, but we're, we're just choosing one. Okay, we're going to take one smart contract. And we put the smart contract onto the blockchain. It's available for use by anyone. OK, easy so far. Excellent. We don't even have any TEs yet. This is very simple. The next thing is independent resource providers. So these are people who have uh, computation, compute devices which can do processing for you. Importantly, they also have TEs in their compute devices. So this is going to be very important. So what they provide is a, a T which is ready to deploy a DAP. It doesn't have a DAP in it yet, but it's ready to deploy one. It's set up uh, to run a DAP. It has some sort of smart contract uh, execution uh, environment within it. And um, so we choose just one of those, and this is attested. This is very important. So we create an attestation measurement. Um, one thing I've not mentioned through any of these is that, of course, you should always verify these. I'm assuming that you always verify them, um, so always verify these. But we don't need to verify it yet. Just, we're just putting it into a smart contract. Okay? So this says, this resource is available to use as part of this smart contract. Okay. So we also have a number of people who can provide dApps. They each have a, an application, distributed application, which can be uh, run uh, in this environment. And again, we just choose one of them. And we create this time just a hash. This is not an attestation measurement because this is not in a T. This is just a hash of an application. And again, we put that into the smart uh, contract. And what we have now is an offer. We have an offer of uh, an environment and a DAP as part of a smart contract. So a consumer comes along, and the consumer says, you know what, I want to find uh, a, a smart contract that will run, and I have some data to run in it. So he looks at that smart contract, and he checks. He says, does this have what I want? If it does, that's good. So he says, right, I'm going to start this smart contract. I'm going to execute it. I'm going to put my data in it, and I'm going to ask for that DAP to put, be put in it as well. And it's now going to run. Now, we should definitely have done some checking of attestation measurements here. Verification is very important. But, and there may be other resources. There might be storage. There might be networking, etc. But this is the basic use case here. And we've seen that the, the user does not need to trust any of these other parties. And now we have output. And that output, of course, carries that attestation measurement, which means that, we can, that the user can be sure that the output did come from the smart contract that he chose before. And that output can, in fact, well, the attestation measurement from it can go onto the blockchain, and possibly even the output, if you wish, can go on the blockchain. Now, there's lots of very interesting questions around this. Uh, things like, um, how do you manage payment? Um, but blockchains and smart contracts know how to do payment, right? There are also questions about which bits do you need to attest and verify when, and uh, how you choose a DAP-ready TE environment. Um, there is an implementation of this by a company called Super Protocol, if you're interested. Um, 
They are a member of the Confidential Computing Consortium. Um, but this is the basic idea. So this has allowed all of these four different untrusting parties to come together and use all of the pieces together and execute a smart contract in a way that the people who care, which is basically the consumer, the user, can be certain that what has come out of it is what is expected. So my final section is on the Confidential Computing Consortium. I've got a couple of slides. Before I do that, are there any questions on this or any of the other use cases? I know they're quite complex, and I have moved very quickly. And I've spoken in English. And uh, I suspect that most people in here do not have English as their first language. Uh, but people have been nodding along quite a lot, so I hope that it's, it's OK. Are there any questions? Please. Um, um, use cases you introduced, um, uh, every out of, of the use case includes attestation measurement, right? Yes. So um, how to prove the output is um, produced by the application in T because, yeah. Excellent. So that's a very good question. Let me, uh, let me uh, go back to the attestation. Uh, 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 I know the basics of remote attestation, but yeah, sure. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just I'll put it up so I can I can explain it. So the answer is, so the question was, how we have attestation measurements that I've shown in each one, but how can you know that the output came from it? The answer is that you can take attestation measurements at any time you want of the uh, of the process and include whichever parts of the TE you want, give or take. So um, it may be that you're actually, uh, depending on, if, if you want the output itself to be signed, then you would sign that later on. If it, you just want to prove that the application uh, that was you're talking to, let's say you're, you're doing a, a TLS, for instance, um, has produced it, you could use a TLS uh, connection with the certificate uh, to, to prove the authenticity of the uh, application you're speaking to. So there's a number of ways of doing it, um, either going back to the original attestation measurement or taking different attestation measurements along the way. It depends on exactly what you're trying to, to get. It's a very important and very good question, though. Thank you. Thank you. And another question. And oh, OK. Is there any um, implementation or a community effort on uh, AI and CC um, use case? Uh, there are implementations. Um, there is a, uh, in terms of open source, mm -hmm. I think that, so let me, I, I'm going to ask that question towards the end, because I, that okay. takes me to the next, next okay, slide. Thanks. OK, fine. Let me talk about Confidential Computing Consortium. I have a lot of slides. There, here we go. So the Confidential Computing Consortium uh, is part of the Linux Foundation. Um, and we are a community uh, focused on open source projects, uh, securing data in use uh, through uh, adoption of confidential computing. And we define confidential computing, as you saw before, as the uh, protection of data in use with a, a, a tested hardware-based TEE. Um, anyone, any company is welcome to join. Uh, we have three different types of members. We have premier members. These are the premier members here. Um, and we have general members. And we have associate members. So associate members are charities, uh, not-for-profits, governmental organizations, um, academics, uh, people like that. 
Um, and we have general members who are the ones in the middle. We have approximately 50 members at the moment. Uh, Fujitsu is a member. Um, Samsung in Korea is, uh, is a member. Uh, Huawei and, uh, and TikTok are a member. We have some other members uh, in Asia Pacific uh, as well. Um, we also have a number of open source projects. <clears throat> so this hopefully may answer your question. Some of these are aimed at um, just general low-level things. For Verizon, for instance, is a, uh, an attestation uh, verification service. Uh, we added Manatee last week. And that, I think, is a framework which allows you to do AI. But it only added very recently. It was added by TikTok. Um, TikTok are very interesting in that they want to prove to governments that they cannot see inside people's data. And using confidential computing is a very good way of doing that. Um, there's an interesting thing about uh, AI use cases, which is that many of them require GPUs. And until recently, using a GPU was difficult uh, with confidential computing. But the N100 chips, uh, yes, the N100 boards from uh, NVIDIA do have a TE in them. Trust establishment is an interesting and complex topic. And if you're interested, you should come and join the CCC and, and, and talk to us about that. Um, but I suspect, I am certain we will have chips from other vendors soon, which also include uh, TEs in GPUs. Um, I should also say that you do not need to be a member of the CCC to come to our meetings. You can just come along. And we love that when it happens. Currently, most of the meetings are not in a friendly time for Japan. But the more people we have from Asia Pacific, the easier it is for me to say we need to have more meetings, uh, which are a friendlier time. And I very much want to do that. So uh, if you can't make them, but you want to, please get in touch with me. Um, as I uh, put right at the, uh, at the top, uh, here are my details. Please um, uh, find me on LinkedIn and connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, you can send me uh, uh, a, a message there or, or speak to me after this, and I will try and help you out. But I would be very, very happy to see all of you uh, at, at our meetings. We have a number of meetings, some very technical, some less technical, some looking at things like uh, government risk and compliance, uh, some on at really low-level Linux kernel uh, pieces as well. So I have about six minutes for questions. So are there any other questions? Please, sir. So what is the secret in uh, attestation service, meaning that attestation service is supposed to be a root of trust or a trust chain, mm -hmm. and perhaps running on a T, its own TE, which may be you know, attested by another attestation service. So how to end the you know, chain of the trust? Yes, this is that's a very difficult uh, question. Uh, and the answer is that at some point, you need to have an endorsing agent. So you need to have an authority that you trust that endorses a particular thing. And that generally needs to be a human or an organization that you trust. Because all trust, in the end, is rooted in, or, in organizations or people. Um, the, the TE chips, they're endorsed by, the, by Intel or AMD or NVIDIA. Um, and the firmware associated with them, again, you have an endorsement. So there is bootstrapping a, an attestation verification service is an extremely interesting and complex thing to do well and safely and scalably, actually. I spent a lot of time thinking about it. Um, and one of the things that we're looking at at the moment in the Confidential Computing Consortium, I, I've written a paper to discuss business models for attestation verification services. Uh, and that includes who you should trust or not trust to run an AVS. 
So should it be uh, a government department? Should it be a regulator? Should it be uh, the CSP? Probably not the CSP. Uh, although in some cases it might be acceptable. Should it be uh, a software vendor? Should it be the Linux Foundation? And the answer to those is yes and no for every single one. But I really want people to get involved and engaged with these questions because in order for confidential computing really to take off in the market, we need to solve business problems and not just technical problems. Um, these are, yeah, these all involve people in the end. And so we need to, or organizations, we need to do that. Okay? Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions, please? Did I give the perfect uh, session? No questions at all. It was a perfect, either, or it was awful, and there are no questions because it was too bad. That's fine. Uh, so I encourage you, please, to, uh, to visit uh, the webpage, uh, to engage, uh, to join the mailing lists and Slack, uh, to come and see me if you have any questions. Thank you so much for your time. It's been an honor and a privilege. Thank you. Arigato gozaimasu.